Today's the feast of the chair of St. Peter the Apostle. <clears throat> first, the first epistle of St. Peter the Apostle. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers, dispersed through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, unto the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy hath regenerated us unto a lively hope by the, res by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, unto an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that cannot fade, preserved in heaven for you, who by the power of God are kept by faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you shall greatly rejoice if now you must be, for a little, while, little time, made sorrowful in diverse temptations, that the trial of your faith, much more precious than gold, which is tried by the fire, may be found unto praise and glory and honor at the appearance of Jesus Christ our Lord. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus came on into the quarters of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? But they said, Some John the Baptist, another some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, But whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answering said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to thee, thou art, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And to thee I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth, on earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. And Father and the Son, <clears throat> the Holy Ghost, Amen. Abraham, I grasp the plate of Almost take him, Benek the Tory Boos. The Benectus, Fuck the Swanties to Jesus. On this feast of St. Peter's, Peter the Apostle's chair, we will examine briefly one of the heresies of Vatican II, <clears throat> namely collegiality. Cardinal Siri had stated the following. There's no doubt that some came to the council with the intention of leading the church into Protestantism, without tradition, scripture alone, and without the primacy of the Pope. For the first goal, a great confusion was created. For the second, they tried to advance the argument of collegiality. In brief, we know that the Pope may exercise his prerogative of infallibility either by himself alone or by associating the bishops to the act in which he engages his personal infallibility. Now collegiality, the word college comes from that word, it's referring to the college of bishops. They want to make them a group of equals which delegates its power to its president. The Pope becomes thereby primus inter pares, that is the first among his peers. Supreme power of the Pope tends to disappear in this error and heresy. In this way, collegiality is a form of aristocracy coming to replace a pontifical monarchy. Now let's review some of the traditional teaching of the Church on pap papal primacy. In order to do this, we have to look at the Council of Trent Pope Leo XIII's document, Satis Cognitum, the Council of Florence, Second Council of Leon, Lyon, and the First Vatican Council. 
In summary, according to the traditional teaching of the church, the church is governed by the pope and the bishops in union with him. And this hierarchical arrangement is iure divino, that is, by divine law. The bishops are successors to the, of the apostles and form the principle of the hierarchy. As successors of the apostles, the bishops perpetuate the apostolic mission. The Episcopal ministry has a twofold character, one sacramental and the other in jurisdictional. The sacerdotal character of the bishop is conferred at, by his ordination or consecration, and it is through the exercise of this sacramental ministry that the mission of the apostles is perpetuated. The right of a bishop to exercise jurisdiction, however, is not conferred by ordination, but rather is granted by the Roman pontiff, who alone has the fullness of jurisdiction in the church. Complete primacy and fullness of power, which has always been understood in terms of an absolute monarchy. Apart from union with and submission to the Roman pontiff, a bishop has no jurisdiction whatsoever. The power of the Roman Moral Pontiff is not simply a primacy of honor or direction, but entails a true and proper jurisdiction over the universal church. This is the faith of the church. Before it is extraordinarily important to have a proper understanding of this distinction between a bishop, sacerdotal's authority, and his jurisdictional authority. To keep these concepts clear, we could illustrate the privileges that flow from a bishop, sacerdotal, and jurisdictional powers like this. While each bishop has true and proper jurisdiction in, within his own diocese, as well as the capacity to wield it by virtue of apostolic succession, he can only enter into the exercise of jurisdiction if he has grant, it is granted to it to by the Pope, who alone has plenary and unlimited jurisdiction in the Church. Much was given to the apostles, including Peter, but there was also authority given to Peter that was not given to the others. Because St. Peter is a church's unity, it is only in unity with Peter that jurisdiction can be legitimate. That is why St. Cyprian calls the See of Rome, quote, the root, the root and matrix of the Catholic Church, and explains with the following quotation. Upon him being one, he builds his church. And although after his resurrection, he bestows equal power upon all the apostles and says, as the Father hath sent me, I also send you. Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, whose sins they, and, whose sin, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Yet that he might display unity, he established by his authority the origin of the same unity as beginning from one. Surely the rest of the apostles also were, were that which Peter was, that is, endowed with an equal partnership of office and of power. But the beginning proceeds from unity, that the Church of Christ might be, be shown to be one. This one Church, also the Holy Ghost and Canticle of Canticles, designates in the person of the Lord and says, quote, One is my dove, my perfect one is but one. She is the only one of her mother, the chosen one of her that bore her. Does he who does not hold this unity think that he holds the faith? And the quote from St. Cyprian. And the magisterium of the church also has echoed this traditional teaching, stating that the whole government of the church was entrusted to Peter. For example, Pope Leo XIII taught, quote, Peter was preeminent among the apostles. He was the mouthpiece of the apostles and the head of the apostolic college. At the same time, showing him that henceforth he ought to have confidence, and as it were, blotting out his denial, he commits to him the government of his brethren. The Pope's government has been traditionally called monarchical, that is, a monarchy. Also, Pope Leo XIII taught, and he asked this in a rhetorical way, whether it was possible for the Roman pontiff to derive his power from the bishop, college of bishops, and the implied answer being negative, 
And this is what he had written, Pope Leo. He who is set over the whole flock must have authority, not only over the sheep dispersed throughout the church, but also when they are assembled together. Do the sheep, when they are all assembled together, rule and guide the shepherd? Do the successors of the apostles assembled together constitute the foundation on which the successors of St. Peter rest in order to derive therefrom strength and stability? All this obviously rules out any sort of democratic concept of church governance, whereby the bishops could have any sort of authority apart from the Pope. As one Catholic writer summarized, at Vatican II, those in favor of collegiality argued that the, doctrinal, that the doctrine of papal primacy, was, as taught by Vatican I, needed to be balanced by the principle of collegiality in governance. The essential doctrine of collegiality is that the power of jurisdiction had been trusted not to Peter alone, but to the Twelve, while not denying that Peter had the primacy the liberals or innovators suggested that it was by virtue of his presidency of the Apostolic College that Peter held this rank, and not by the special direct commission of Jesus Christ. Authority is entrusted to the Twelve, and Peter was as authority by virtue of being head of the Twelve, as the liberals say. Thus the Twelve is the, tw the true body of authority, and this is the heart of, of the heresy of collegiality. As we know from history, the liberals won in the vote at the Vatican II, despite a small flock, as among them was Archbishop Lefebvre, to go against this. They were outnumbered. The text of Vatican II distinguishes two supreme powers in a church. The supreme power of the Pope, acting alone, and the supreme power of the Episcopal College, acting with his head. The teaching of collegiality by divine right is extended to the acts of national Episcopal conferences. Thus, regional or national conferences of bishops living in all parts of the world are expressions of collegial authority. As one Catholic writer summarizes, the Episcopal conferences, which formerly had a useful deliberate, deliberative function, have now become organs of decision, forming common policy by their majority vote and so diminishing the personal responsibility of their members. The bishop was formerly a monarch in his own diocese, subject only to the Pope, and a father in God to his people. Now he's hardly that any longer, being bound in all matters of importance by the majority decisions of his conference. It was this exaltation of the Episcopal conferences with the connivance of the reigning Pope at that time with Paul VI which made it possible after the council for the liberal modernist party to assume complete control of the church and to push through its October revolution, regardless of all past dogmas and definitions, regardless even of the literal sense of the Vatican II's decrees. No individual bishop would have dared to adopt measures such as the virtual destruction of the Holy Mass in favor of a kind of Protestant, Protestant Lord's Supper or to make it or to make liturgical innovations which entail grave irreverence towards the Blessed Sacrament, or to imperil the faith and morals of Catholic school children by scrapping the Orthodox catechisms for the sake of modernist ones, such as the Dutch type, and imposing a salacious sex education in line with neo-pagan practice. All these and much others, these monstrous mutations have been carried out by a nameless, impersonal episcopate and despairing faithful, so recently glorified as the people of God, have no redress and no appeal. Indeed, the Church of Vatican II now has become a dictatorship of the bureaucracy, very similar to the communists. The net result of this collegial democratic devolution is destruction of Catholic unity with a different religion in every parish. If the Pope is no longer to be monarch in the Church, neither will the bishop be monarch in his diocese. Early we will put into commission, the talking will never cease, and the hungry sheep will not be fed. Can any sane Catholic pretend that this is the kind of charge or commission that Jesus Christ laid on his apostles? 
Last but not least, as we know from the Revelations, the Blessed Virgin Mary had at Fatima, at Quito, and La Salette, and other Catholic prophecies that nothing will improve until the triumph of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart and the glorious reign of the great Holy, Holy Pontiff, together with the great Holy Monarch, to restore the true Catholic faith worldwide. Let us continue praying our rosary every day for this triumph. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.